Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to speak for Monash University on the opening government for the fifth consecutive World's Grand Final. And we are particularly excited at this moment because this is a topic which we entirely believe. The nation state, ladies and gentlemen, is, a, is an artificial concept, but it's a beneficial concept. At Monash, we're going to prove two key things to you. Firstly, that the nationalism and the nation state has more benefits than harm. And secondly, we will show you that nationalism is superior to alternative conceptions of collective identity, such as class, such as religion, such as sexuality, if that does exist. But it's also superior to no collective identity, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the key premises we're going to be advancing at opening government. We're not going to be comparing nationalism in this debate to a theoretical cosmopolitan utopia because that simply doesn't exist. What we're going to do is look at nationalism as it exists now and compare it to other forms of identity as they exist right now. I'll have three key arguments at Prime Minister. Firstly, I'll explain to you why nationalism is a critical unifying framework. Secondly, I'll look at why nationalism helps promote essential sacrifice, which is crucial to the state. And thirdly, I'll look at how nationalism is the most inclusive framework of collective identity that exists. So firstly, why nationalism is a critical unifying framework. So what exactly do we mean by nationalism? Well, if nationalism essentially is based on a belief in the strength and the power of the nation state. It's premised on a few things. It's premised on reveling, on, reveling in specific commonalities, even though you have a range of other differences between other members of the state. It's based on supporting the collective endeavour of your country, their economy, their healthcare system, the education system. It's based on sharing a joint future which is ultimately based on cooperation, or if not cooperation, at least tolerance for the other members of your state, ladies and gentlemen. We, of course, recognise that the level of feeling associated with nationalism does not apply uniformly. We recognise that often in new states, it takes time to develop that type of strong national identity, which is so essential for all the benefits we believe in. But we believe nationalism is something which does reinforce itself over time. Because as more and more people opt into this, it's harder and harder to opt out of that shared collective identity. It's harder and harder and harder to opt out of that common belief that your country is important, ladies and gentlemen. So why is this so significant? We believe it's absolutely fundamental for a population to succeed and to derive benefits. We say, ladies and gentlemen, particularly for countries riven by sectarian dissent, say hypothetically a country like Rwanda in the 1990s, the, the preoccupation with ethnic divides was incredibly corrosive. And the only way this kind of country could move beyond that is through a collective identity based on the nation state, based on a recognition that the differences based on ethnicity, based on sect, ladies and gentlemen, are less important than the commonality of being part of the same nation. This is particularly important if you look at contexts say, such as post-apartheid South Africa, ladies and gentlemen. We say for post-apartheid South Africa, it was so crucial to be able to unify behind the South African rugby team, a national team which represented every member of that country, ladies and gentlemen. That was absolutely essential to moving beyond these conflicts and recognising their limitations. Moreover, we believe that conflict often builds when nationalism breaks down. So when countries become driven by sectarian divides, like in Yugoslavia, once national uh, identity becomes corroded, that's when the worst harms happen in terms of having collective identity and reduced conflict. Um, I will take over. Sir, but the problems are exacerbated at the point where nation states feel as if they need to tie national identity to ethnic identity and cleanse anyone who is not a part of that national identity. <laughs> It's not our burden in this debate to defend extreme ethnic identities and polarizations within the state. The key premise of our case is that nationalism, which is purely about commonalities, is the ideal that is most important for a harmonious and peaceful society. So second argument, why does this enhance the likelihood of sacrifice? We believe, ladies and gentlemen, human cohabitation relies both on trust, but also on a willingness to sacrifice for other members of your community. No, thank you. And that's because not all individuals have the same capacity to ensure that other members within their society are protected. So a good example of this is war, ladies and gentlemen. On the opening government, we don't always support war, but we recognise that it's sometimes necessary, whether because of resources, whether because of defending your country itself. 
We say when wars are necessary, they're more likely to have support within the country, more likely to be effective once you base this on national identity, ladies and gentlemen. We say when you make that difficult choice to go to war and risk your life, you have to believe in something that's worth risking your life for. We think it's absolutely fundamental to have that national identity, that national belief to power you to make that choices. That's much more likely than if your only identity is constructed around your religion, around your family, around your class, where you don't have any reason to actually mobilise for the collective well-being. That's hard. This is important also in the context of public service, ladies and gentlemen. We saw one of the key drivers for people to enter public service, to make sacrifices in terms of their pay, in terms of their conditions, and to work really hard to the benefit of their country, is when they believe they're sacrificing for something that matters. That occurs when that's based on this cohesive national framework that people want to sacrifice for, want to put this energy into. That's how you get all of those benefits through a national identity being constructed that's sturdy enough to power those kinds of sacrifices. So my final argument, ladies and gentlemen, is why nationalism is the most inclusive framework. We recognise, ladies and gentlemen, that there are other ways in which identity are shaped. We recognise that religion, like class, like, like social strata, ladies and gentlemen, are all significant ways in which individuals form bonds with other people. And some of them share the same benefits of our plan. The key difference with nationalism, ladies and gentlemen, is it's much easier to opt in and it's much easier to opt out. If you want to be part of a particular community, you can make that choice to live in that community or to move away from that community, ladies and gentlemen. You can't do that with something like religion or something like class, ladies and gentlemen, because other people within that class won't recognise your attempts to be part of that particular identity. So you have a greater capacity to actually be part of an identity and get that certainty and get the collective benefits that emerge from being that identity through nationalism rather than through divisive identities like religion, which are much harder, both in terms of your internal recognition and in terms of the external recognition, ladies and gentlemen. This is both fairer and more and more harmonious. When you consider the huge movement of people from border to border, it's crucial to have identities which aren't constructed by immutable characteristics like your religion or your class. So ladies and gentlemen, we believe that nationalism isn't perfect, but it's the best form of identity generation. It carries major benefits for the state. It's the most inclusive framework. We're proud to propose. Madam Speaker, at its core, national identity is but an imagined community. What we stand for on opposition is the idea that imagined value should not trump real benefits for yourself and for other people in society. While there may not be the cosmopolitan utopia, we think the general directions in which um, states have been moving in has been the idea that states that are divorced from identity are in better positions to provide meaningful benefits for their own citizens and to better cooperate with other states in the international community. We see that theocracies are often poorly suited to serve the interests of their citizens or to engage fruitfully with others precisely because they're muddying up the role of the state and the ideology itself. We say that we support a minimal state that's focused on enabling individuals to do things that they cannot do themselves, to provide for defense, to provide for individuals' defenses against each other and to respect property. We don't think that the state should have a role in facilitating the creation of identity. The notion that that should be a standard for this round seems absurd. So before I get on substantive matter, we're going to talk about a few points of rebuttal. First, the idea that this is good because it's a unifying framework. First, we say, this is an arbitrary heuristic, often one that comes at the expense of empathizing with other people, because you are a nation only insofar as other people aren't part of that nation, and there are a host of bad things that come about that as a result. 
They talk about this idea that it's good at supporting a collective endeavor. It's problematic because collective identities often struggle when there are instances when there's discord within other members who might want to claim they're part of that collective identity. That's when you have tensions which these systems are poorly suited to deal with. They argue that they're uniquely able to derive um, benefits by allowing for sacrifice. But insofar as some people need to sacrifice for the benefit of others, that often means that there exists some sort of difference between these populations of people. We think that to the extent that nationalism is predicated on imagining the sameness and the commonality, you don't often think that sacrifice is necessary to support others differently situated. We think the conclusion you draw is those people aren't meaningfully part of the same nation. So you're poorly suited to make the sacrifice necessary there. So when they talk about this idea that they're more likely to support, um, to successfully support wars, we flip it on its head. Because where nationalism becomes a primary guiding post of policy, you see more wars entered into that ought not happen. World War I is a good example of that. They argue that people can't look to identifying principles elsewhere, like class, like other things. We say that the state shouldn't be the actor that facilitates that role itself. They haven't shown you why that ought to be the state's burden to do so. They talk about why it's inclusive and thus easy to opt out. We say it's almost impossible to opt out when one, the things that define what makes you perhaps part of one nation versus another may preclude you from moving across borders, may preclude you from calling yourself part of another nation because being part of another nation involves some intractable feature which you do not happen to possess. That's a problem on their side of the house. So why do we think that nationalism detracts from cooperative outcomes that benefit all people? Because it hasn't come up in any other rounds at this tournament, I'm going to talk about the lottery of birth. So what we say, uh, Madam Speaker, is when we are born, we are born into community. We are born with certain characteristics, features, and born into cultures that we didn't choose we didn't consent to, but those will meaningfully affect, within a nationalist setting, what groups we can call ourselves a part of. The idea that the preservation of these things, or the furtherance of these things that you never meaningfully opted into, ought to occur at the expense of tangible benefits, perhaps to yourself or other members within the state, is not justified whatsoever. What we also say is when you feel as though your national identity or your imagined identity is in conflict with what the state does, we think that you're less inclined to meaningfully engage with the state. So there isn't a real opt-out in that instance. You're not in a position to meaningfully measure your political, uh, express your political rights as you would if this wasn't such an influential thing. Second thing I want to talk about, why we think that this can be abused in many instances. We believe that because nationalism is, all, is often a very visceral, very potent, very toxic sort of co concept, it is often leveraged by politicians and leaders to get people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. When a dictator or a bad leader recognizes that a united population of people could stop him or her, often dividing people by fomenting different nationalist sentiments is nothing more than a means of propping up a legit illegit illegitimate regime. We don't think that's a good thing. We think that, it, that sectarian interests often become a national cause, and when that ideology bleeds into an argument for how the political apparatus ought to be organized, that's when you see massive violence the world over throughout history. What we also think that is in, um, in public policy, these sorts of, actually, pause, opening. So you've offered no comparison with other forms of collective identity. Isn't nationalism one of the only ways to help dilute the worst impacts of ethnic and sectarian division? So we think the basis by which you should choose what state you support, what state you live in, is how well that state provides goods that matter to you, or goods that are material, that benefit the population, like defense, like economic policies that allow you to start businesses and prosper, or welfare policies that are meaningful to help those who are less well off. These are substantive reasons to organize and prefer a state, not an imagined community. That's the comparison. There you go. Enjoy. We also think that this can be abused for foreign policy. 
Think of instances like India and Pakistan, uh, Taiwan and China, where these sorts of identity politics are used to just foment anger within the population periodically, which happens at times which happen to coincide with elections, when politicians want to detract information from elsewhere. We don't think nationalism is good in the sense it creates a tool for politicians. We further say that public policy like immigration, things that from a material point of view would benefit society, when those are harmed by the presence of nationalism that doesn't serve the people, it doesn't serve the communities within that, it'd be better if we organize things differently, we're proud to oppose. Barack Hussein Obama said, there are no black Americans, there are no white Americans, there are just Americans. That statement can only exist in a nationalistic society to believe in something other than those identities. That statement can only have meaning and unify people if there is a thing called America that is more than just borders, but is indeed a collective identity that people subscribe to and enjoy. Nationalism is good. First thing I want to look at, First thing I want to look at, the harms that nationalism has been accused of. The first general class was, ah, but nationalism is often used as an excuse for violence, like ethnic violence was the example given in a point of information. We think that examples of inter-ethnic violence are examples of failures of nationalism, not of the full function of the thing that we support. We think that when you hate someone else for being different from you, the best way, and in fact the only way to fix that, given that you can't change a lot of the differences between people such as race, is to find another immutable characteristic that you can all subscribe to cohesively. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the nation. But not just the borders of the nation, and not just the government, but the notion of the nation as a collective that supersedes you, that you want to contribute to, that you have an interest in thriving beyond you. That's when you don't hate people who are different to you, because they're actually all just Americans. We think that those differences are less likely to exist when nationalism actually is robust. And yes, nationalism does involve a certain amount of exclusion, right? If you are an American, that means by definition you think you're better than people who are not American. I assume that's what it means. But, to the extent that all collective identities must be based on exclusion, why do we prefer nationalism? Because you can't change a lot of things about yourself. If you are black and people have formed an identity around hating black people, you cannot access that. But almost without any uh, counterpoint, nationalism is accessible by all. You just have to subscribe to the values and to the concept of the state. You have to show patriotism and you can be participant in it. You don't have to, right? You can be the least nationalistic person in a country. I might be the least nationalistic Australian because I don't like cricket. But I can. The, like, the avenues of entering into that collective are open to me, where they might not be open otherwise. Secondly, what we heard is that wars are created by nationalism. Incorrect. Wars are created for security reasons, for the selfishness of individuals wanting resources, for the selfishness of individuals wanting to feel protected, or for the expansionary ideals of governments, right? But the question is if a war does or does not happen, what is the best way for a community to be able to protect itself? And we don't think that it's for a minimalist account of the state where everyone is an atomized individual participant in the cosmopolitan mass. It is when you believe that a threat to Australia is a threat to you. That is the only way that you protect other people and we think that sadly that is sometimes necessary. What we heard from opening opposition was we think that certain characteristics are immutable and that nation nationalism is one. We disagree. You can choose to stop being a living member of a nation or even a nationalistic member of a nation. And that is a far less immutable characteristic than the ones that you are born with. Closing. When nationalism invokes only one set of values, can't politicians suppress dissent by invoking that in political actions like Bush did through the Patriot Act? Yes, and then all of the counterpoints can say, actually, it's not American to like reduce freedom. In fact, it is thoroughly un-American. We think that there is constant vigorous debate about what that nation means, and that's why it changes over time. That debate is a good thing because it means public values are clear and they're constantly talked about, rather than just individuals talking about their own values and never, I guess, engaging with anyone else's. Second point I want to look at, the benefits of nationalism. 
What we heard in response to all the benefits that Kieran put to you was from the opening opposition, oh, those are actually just the benefits of the state, not the benefits of nationalism. The full functioning of the state needs nationalism to work. For people to cooperate with laws, they can't just believe that a police officer will arrest them because there aren't enough police officers to arrest everyone. You have to have an interest in the order of the people around you. You have to have an interest in the thing that you live in, possibly even beyond your own life, beyond your own borders and beyond that of your family. Because you see that there is something that you do believe in there. Because if you like America, your children should like America, your neighbours should like America, and you have an interest in protecting America and complying with the laws. We think that other things like religion, other things like ethnicity, even sexuality, to the extent that does or could challenge the idea of nationalism, one day. We think those are alternative directions, those alternative directions of allegiance other than the state are actually the things that threaten the full function of the state. So if you can get lots of benefits from collectivization, which was conceded, they said it's just provided through the state, we think that having an identity based on ethnicity weakens that state by creating an alternate source of allegiance, right, to your God, to a group of people and not to the nation itself. We think that humans need to collectivise to thrive and that nationalism is the certainty of that collective. It's the certainty of the collective you participate in and other people helping you. Those are the goods that matter to people that opposition leader was talking about. That's why the state offers those goods to people because nationalism offers certainty in that. The final point I want to look at is a substantive point about the importance of belief in the state as a concept. If you value and believe in your state, if you love your nation, and importantly, if you conceive of your nation as having values and characteristics that you want to survive beyond your own life and beyond your own direct experiences, that is a good thing. Why? Firstly, because you're more likely to plan in the long term and believe and have an interest in the cohesiveness of that nation. Incidentally, that's the only way international commerce could function. Otherwise, no one would believe that a country would repay its loans, that a country would, would like, fulfil its treaty obligations, that a country would ever engage in commerce the same way tomorrow as it did today. But it does, because the nation state and the concept of nationalism has a direction forward through time. It has a certainty that comes when the collective believes in that certainty. We think that the, like, you only plan in the long term if you believe in the state, and we don't think you only believe in the state if you have a nationalistic attitude. But the second benefit of belief in the state is it reduces what I've called the tragedy of community commons. If you don't have an interest in America as a concept, then you have far less of an interest in politics, in laws, in actions that do not directly affect you and your family. We think that the idea of people going out of their way to protect others, we think the idea of people voting on anything other than their direct interests or like the things that might interest them can only exist when you believe in a polity that is beyond your own. We think that belief in the state is one of the best benefits of nationalism. What has Monash told you in this debate? We've told you that it is not reasonable to compare nationalism to a utopia of cosmopolitan love for everyone. But compared to the other ways in which humans can and do collectivise, things like ethnicity, religion, sexuality, we think that nationalism is better. It offers benefits of altruism, belief in the state, longevity, and it is far more accessible than any type of collective identity. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that it is important that there is an America, not just a black or a white America. So clearly the American flag was ironic for the purposes of this one. <laughs> I think it's interesting how Amit starts his speech with an ode to Barack Obama. Because while as inspiring as the quote about not a black America, not a white America, but the United States of America was, I think it would have been perhaps a bit more inspiring if he said, the world is composed not of black people, not of white people, but of people. People irrespective of Canadian or Australian or British are as deserving of rights, 
benefits, respect, and tolerance as everyone who is in the United States of America, whether black or whether white. That would have been the most inspiring narrative for him, for Barack Obama to have said, but unfortunately because we live in a world in which politicians have to appeal to concepts like national identity, he wasn't able to say that, and the United States, despite having elected Barack Obama, still had trouble divorcing itself from nationalistic politics political pressure on the Republican Party, by the Republican Party and the Tea Party to define American national interests in narrow terms and to only be involved in foreign countries for the sake of exploiting them for our national interests irrespective of the welfare of citizens of the country. That is the danger of nationalism. I want to clear up the ground in today's debate because while we clearly don't support strong national identities, we obviously exist in a world in which there are states. We think worlds in which those states move more towards collectives like the European Union and other forms of international organization that minimize barriers between states are good. We think that's the best way to achieve in the long run the type of cosmopolitan vision that may be impossible now, but in an ideal world, but not in a just world, would not be impossible. But we also recognize that things like religion, class, other forms of identity still exist. Here is the key distinction between the benches in this debate. What we say is that none of those other forms of identity, or any form of identity, ought be the basis for organizing a state and distributing benefits within that state. I think it's interesting that Ferris talks to you about theocracies, and we never hear a response as to whether or not, if people within a nation decided that they wanted to organize on the basis of a religion and make that their national identity, they would be free to do so. Because while religious organization may be dangerous in terms of inculcating certain values within a community, you know what's much more dangerous? When you give the state apparatus with its power to tax punish, imprison, and invade other countries, the ability to use its religious views or other forms of national identity as the basis of the exercise of power, then you, are exploiting, then you are exploiting people and denying people's rights on the basis of completely morally arbitrary characteristics, whether or not it's religion or whether or not it's another form of identity. First, a bit more rebuttal before I talk about the type of international community that we envision on our side of the house and how a world in which nationalism isn't the source of state identity, it, 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 sorry, isn't the source of state power and state function, is a world in which individuals throughout society and throughout the world are better off. But first, a little bit about what Amit says. Amit talks about ethnic violence and saying that, well, ethnic violence is an example of people organizing along ethnic lines, not along national lines. No, Amit, ethnic violence is an example of people organizing on ethnic lines and using that as the basis to compete for a national identity. If you minimize the extent to which states legitimate, if you minimize the extent to which any identity, whether ethnic, whether religious, or whether arbitrary based on where you happen to be born, is if you minimize the extent to which that allows the state to organize, then you decrease the legitimacy of any group of people that try to command national power, whether it's on the basis of religion or whether it's on the basis of ethnicity. No, thank you. The next thing that we hear from him is this idea um, that it's nationalism, while you may not be able to meaningfully opt out of it, you can more meaningfully opt out of it than you can religion. First, this just isn't true if national identity is defined by where you were born. You can't opt out of where you were born. You will then be discriminated against throughout the the world on the basis of where you were born. He talks about Australian identity and liking cricket. Well, yes, like you can come to like cricket. You know what's a much easier basis, though, to opt in and out of a society? Whether or not you like the government's tax policy, or whether or not you like the fact that Australia has a lot of minerals and wants to live in a country in which you can invest significantly in mining. We think those types of preferences are much less morally re or are less morally irrelevant than the types of arbitrary situations in which people on the basis of the lottery birth, as Ferris tells you, are currently forced into a national identity and are currently forced into a set of political structures with decreased ability to move because they will consequently be discriminated against on the basis of those arbitrary characteristics as opposed to the choices they consciously make. Steph. So in what way do you propose reducing the ways in which people define their other identities, that is to say class, race, etc., and making those less salient despite their divisiveness? Okay. We obviously believe that people will continue to organize along those lines. What we are saying, and this is a principal debate, is that states ought not organize and distribute power on the basis of any of those identities or of any other form of identity, particularly where you happen to be born. 
any source of identity as the basis and legitimacy of national power, which is the philosophy that nationalism espouses, is bad. You can talk about all the other forms of identity that you want. All of those, when they lead to control over the state reins of power, are going to be harmful. The next thing I want to talk about, though, is Amit's point about how nationalism leads to an interest in your society, and that you're not going to have an interest in your society if you don't have a national identity around which to organize. We think this is silly. First, there's the obvious example of you live in the country and want benefits for yourself, your family, future generations. But much more importantly, we believe individuals are fundamentally good and altruistic. We think the reason why individuals want to help people in their country is because they see themselves as like those other people and want good things to happen to them. Had to happen to them. Nationalism arbitrarily limits that extent of that altruism by saying it ought to be constrained only to individuals with whom you happen to share this national identity as opposed to the common humanity that we all share. This leads me to the point I want to talk about, about how changing and eroding the idea of nationalism increases the ability for countries throughout the world to better provide for their people. We think first and foremost in just really basic examples of idea like fewer wars started. Yes, maybe people are slightly less willing to join an army to defend themselves, although we don't think that's true because, well, you don't want to die and have your nation attacked. But more importantly, what we would say is that if you never have the basis of national identity in the first place, then you never have the desire for national glory, for the desire to expand your nation and increase your, your glory and the power of your people by conquering others. It's what led to manifest destiny and taking over the land of the Native Americans in the case of the United States, because we believed as a people that we deserved the land and we're better than them and we're entitled to it and needed it for ourselves. We think when you take away the construct of the nation state and just have a bunch of different political entities that provide benefits, individuals then don't limit their altruism to only those people with whom they happen to share this arbitrary national identity, they instead are more willing to extend it, whether it's via foreign aid, whether it's a desire not to attack their neighbor, in any of those meaningful ways, they extend it to people throughout the world that leads to a more tolerant world, a more cooperative world, and ultimately one in which we all, people, are better off. We oppose. Even though that could have been set in opposition to 
to colonialism, colonialist interests. It wasn't. It was set purely in positive terms in terms of what the Tanzanians can do for themselves. So we don't agree that it has to be set necessarily in opposition to anyone else. Moreover, they say, well, look, this is between wars between states. And we say this is overly simplistic, ladies and gentlemen. Any war has to be conducted on like a multitude of grounds in terms of strategic interests, the kind of resources you can mobilize, like what the other state has comparative to you. The only example they can give you is World War One, which was not done on nationalism, ladies and gentlemen. It was about like an entangled strain of alliances. So this just doesn't actually stand for their side of the house in terms of creating more conflict. And like we'd like them to give us some more examples. The only one we could possibly think of would be former Yugoslavia, but of course that was where you had weak state institutions which couldn't properly promote this. And again, it was ethnic nationalism, not the civic nationalism which we're giving you. So those don't stand. But why should you support nationalism then? Well, first of all, we talk here about the good of the state. Now, recognise that everyone has multiple identities. But what those identities are, are about the ways in which we begin to assess values, our sense of belonging, beliefs, and the ways in which we interact with other people in our community, the ways in which we form, the ways in which we want to live, and the ways in which you know, we understand other people. Crucially, these are always malleable, and they're always shaped by both participants and other actors in relation to those participants as they live their lives. And therefore we can, and we definitely think we should, pro states should proactively define this form of identity to nationalism to be a positive view of yourself and your community. Why is that? Well, it's because when you get that, you don't necessarily crowd out the other identities which you still hold, right? I'm still, might be an atheist or a white woman, but, that, but I can still, within Britain, say identify with a Muslim Pakistani immigrant man who is also British. So one of those sorts of things, those sorts of common bonds which enable you to view other citizens as similar to you, even when on the face of it they might be incredibly different, that has numerous payoffs, ladies and gentlemen, which you don't get the kind of leeway under, under their side of the house. Do you honestly believe that nationalism can accommodate and represent every person within that nationalist project? We think comparative to what, as I said in my rebuttal, comparative to any other form of identity, absolutely. But moreover, we say because you, because you do build these positive nationalisms, that is that is the way in which most people can buy into it. Because moreover, we say is quick, 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 to get into my main points. First of all, because it stops it stops people from being able to appeal to violence to subgroups, right? The point at which you're, you have faith in a, a macro institution of your national identity, you don't feel the need to retreat into ethnic boundaries beneath that in order to wage violence against other groups, because you have a faith that, your, that the national institution is going to be protecting everyone, precisely because that is so well established at the top, ladies and gentlemen. Second of all, we says that enables states to undertake policies which might then help, help their states in the long run. And, and, particularly when they have to have short-term sacrifice, they can appeal to a larger picture into the future. So we say, for instance, we look at Turkey, which is incredibly nationalistic, and the sacrifices it has to take in order to get EU ascension. Those kind of economic restructuring programs are a lot easier when you can say, look, we're trying to fulfill our nation's destiny in pushing forward the state's um, position within international politics. And that's something you don't get on their side of the house when you do just end up with parochial interests trading off of each other. And we think, furthermore, in the first instance, it enables policies that help most people, particularly when we look at most countries emerging out of colonialism, we look for, for instance, Latin America, and the kinds of positive nationalisms we see in Venezuela, in Bolivia, which are tied to projects about helping everyone, because we tie everyone's interests to everyone within the polity, not parochial class interests, which means you're much more likely to get policies which are more equitable in terms of the economic redistribution to other people within the state. We think that's positive for enabling all citizens to access goods, whether or not they want to buy in to the nationalist project. So second of all then, looking at the civil bias, and we say that precisely because you create this identity which is bigger than you, an indomitability of spirit, you enable people to accept trade-offs within states which they, which they otherwise might not accept. So for instance, you can accept the democratic rules of the game, saying that I may disagree with you as a Republican or a Democrat, but I respect you because you are also an American, and we are tied to a common project of American greatness and exceptionalism, which means that, for instance, you expect you respect the institutions of the state, the institutions of the presidency, even if you don't necessarily respect the views of the incumbent. And that means you get the kind of discourse, which means that you do can sustain democracy and exchange of ideas in the long run, which again, therefore protects even subnational identities, which they want to do, precisely because you have these greater degrees of freedom. By solidifying macro institutions at the top, ladies and gentlemen, you enable subnational institutions to thrive. But even just having that national macro institution on its own is a source of pride for people. And we think that's something that's valuable, it's something which ties communities together, and which we're happy to support.
job session. Madam Speaker, in this debate, opposition celebrated the claim by Barack Obama that it wasn't a black America and a white America, just the United States of America. Opening opposition would rather he had more cosmopolitan rhetoric. A closing opposition, we just rather he didn't lie. Because we believe that when it comes to trying to get a job, or the likelihood that you're going to be frisked by police, or your capacity to join the political elite of your country, there is a white America and a black America. We believe that we will accept the challenge of opening the hand, that these different forms of identity are more important, are more useful, are more valuable. That's the extension we're going to bring to you in this debate. First of all, I'm going to talk about why these other identities are better. Second of all, I'm going to talk about why they're harmed, even if this state is an ethno-nationalist. And finally, about the use of history and tradition in politics before moving on to some other rebuttal that doesn't fit within my extension. First of all, why are other identities better? Because all forms of identities are often mobilised by political elites. Opposition concedes that in this debate. But very few are wholly contrived by political elites. We think this is what sets nationalism apart. Because when a religious leader stands before you and says this is what it means to be a Christian, your capacity disagrees because you reference to a text. It is substantiated by something outside the words of that speaker. The presentation of nationalism from opening government is it specifically a rhetorical construct of the state to persuade you to buy into that state project. Insofar as that's true, you can't necessarily dissent from that view. So the way in which the American government was able to say what it means to be American is to hate terrorists, their capacity, when, as according to the logic of proposition, the state and nationalism are inherently fused, is that because the state is doing that action, it's incredibly difficult to dissent outside that state, to, to attack that, without being undermined by the extent to which you yourself remain an American in that context. We think it's different, right? Because it's fundamentally fused with state power, because the elites you're meant to be electing are controlling the production of this form of identity. But also, one of the best things about these identities in comparison to nationalism is they make no claim to unify. They make no claim to minimize your difference. Instead, they celebrate it. What we think, unfortunately, about nationalism is while its object is often to unify people, in fact, it just removes people's capacity to be different. And that damages them even more, makes them more isolated than just being different could be. Because when the American state becomes a Christian state, that marginalizes people far more than just being Christian and Muslim. Because the whole project of nationalism was meant to be unified. So there's something deficient about you because you can't ascribe to it because it isn't linked to you. We think that's very damaging. Okay. In a state that is majority Christian, how do you ever make the majority care about the minority if you're celebrating just them being Christian? We don't think the state should celebrate people being Christian. That was not the, bo the burden of the op in this debate, right? What we suggested at this particular point is that the state doesn't construct an identity ball. That was the first thing you heard from the Prime Minister, right, in his conception of what a state was. What we believe is when you grab nationalist projects, you allow them the right to narrate a national story to their people, and that's particularly damaging. Why? Because Prop Bench only wanted to talk about nationalism where it worked. They're like, not the kind of nationalism that leads to civil strife. It's like, not the kind of nationalism in Rwanda and Yugoslavia. They said it helped in post-apartheid. Miss Madam Speaker, it caused apartheid. We believe in this debate. You can't just say interrupt the nationalism. At their incredibly low burden and only talk about universalizing nationalism, only talk about nationalism that don't attempt to just say we're a Christian country. Why are they still damaging? Because politicians don't have an interest, nor do they have the capacity to actually create a universalizing nationalism. We look at American history, we look at American identity over time, and we see that it's a particular picture being presented, and a picture that doesn't speak universally, but purports to do just that. How does it do this? We believe the American dream says that America is capitalist. That's damaging if you're American and a socialist. We believe that the white picket fence suburban narrative of Americana identity says that it's wrong if you're gay. We think it says it's wrong if you don't subscribe to that particular way of life. And all the while, it's saying that at that particular 
important, you need to connect to that identity. Why is this damaging? Because opening government said two things about nationalism. They're like, it's great because you can opt in and out. And the other time they, they talked about nationalism, they said the power and function of nationalism is when you use nationalism because you believe that your neighbours believe in it, because you believe your children believe in it, because you believe your entire community, your entire state believes in it. Insofar as that's true, you have a limited capacity to opt out under that particular time. We think that's damaging. If, 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 as value the, the, this, this central national future, or most people do. We think that's damaging because that national image can't describe minorities if it's going to appeal to the majority, which is the political incentive around the construction of nationhood. What are the consequences of this that are so damaging? We need to look no further than the benefits of nationalism espoused by the proposition bench, both opening and closing half. Nationalism measures your capacity to sacrifice. It measures your capacity to be included, your willingness to respect the law. We believe that it's damaging to these communities when they're excluded from those nationalist projects. It's no accident there's more crime in black communities. It's not just caused by poverty. We believe it's also caused by the idea that the state doesn't hold their interests at heart. We think it ferments oppression while helping people forget about it. We think it's damaging when Barack Obama stands up as a black American and implies that we are just one America. Obviously, that's his political incentive to do that. He doesn't want to frighten the white people. But what we believe in this debate is that what he does is a disservice to a community that is still oppressed by white people by pretending that they're all part of a national project that assists some people more than others. That fiction is damaging because the other identities, which are often essential to people, unlike nationalism, like your race, something you can't change, is now ultimately something that has been used to, to, uh, to, to be silenced and ignored from that political tradition. We think that is incredibly damaging. We also think it's damaging and patronising to say to citizens, as opening and closing government have done, that in order to have a motivation to be compassionate, one necessarily has to have that dressed up in the ideological construct of nationalism. Why can't I just care about my neighbours, my communities and my families in the first place? They are sufficient to motivate me to pay tax, to go to war, to respect the law. Hell, I just want some of my tax money back. I just want a stable society. I just want other people to respect the law. That's a sufficient motivation. And as far as we don't require it in order to, 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 to do those particular things, we think it's damaging to tell people a lie that ultimately we are all one country. When there are differences that should be and are more valuable to other people, we are so proud to oppose.
What we tell you on side proposition is that the national project of Tanzania was not to say, look, here's a way in which we can radically define ourselves against the colonizers who made our lives such hell for the past several centuries. The project of Tanzania was to talk about the positive attributes of the Tanzanian people and the Tanzanian state. And what that ultimately created was an extremely peaceful Tanzania under Julius Nyerere, a peaceful Tanzania that transcended uh, ethnic divisions, that transcended religious differences, and that didn't make war against other states because it took its project as being a positive <coughs> rather than negative one. They don't tell you how any of the other identities that, mind you, do not cease to exist if you oppose the motion can do the same. The next thing they tell you is that everything else has external reference, right? So the reason it's okay for Christianity to be able to say this is what's Christian and what's not is because you can point to a book. But nationalism, on the other hand, is something that political elites just get to define arbitrarily. What we would say instead is that that also enables you as an individual to actively shape what you see as being relevant to your nationality. <laughs> what we also think is that means there is more ultimately creative possibility that you get as a result of that. And finally, it means that you have a much higher opportunity for inclusiveness than you would under, under concepts like Christianity or under concepts like class. So what they tell you finally is that you can't opt out. Right, that there is no way to escape the totalizing power of nationalism. What we tell you is, well, A, you can move, right? Like, if you dislike your nation, you can probably pick a new one. I currently live in, the, in England, well, admittedly not because I dislike the US, but I could try and stay if I wanted. The next thing that we want to tell you, though, is that you can still change the understanding of what it means to be a part of that nation. And we argue that you do indeed see those changes happen over time. They want to talk about the ways in which the United States ends up being racially divided or divided by class. But note that the United States as an entity views itself far differently than it did at the founding of our Constitution, when the United States of America was apparently only elite, property, uh, rich men, which we think is ultimately a shift that was produced by the people of the United States in favor of the concept of the state. And we think that's critical. So why do we think nationalism is superior to other identities? Well, first off, we get this challenge that, you know, nationalism is something that enables you to limit other people's participation. What we tell you is that we aren't in favor of nationalism that defines on other identity characteristics, because then we would be proposing that we were in favor of those other identity characteristics. That's not the debate. So we aren't saying that this house supports ethnicity, or this house supports religion. We're saying this house supports nationalism. Which we see as being a form out of civic nationalism, as Jen points out to you in her speech, talking about the ways in which we see each other as members of a shared community, members who share a collective identity, and who strive towards a political project that ultimately ends up reinforcing those commonalities rather than reinforcing our differences. But I'll take closing. You said that in the former state of Yugoslavia there was lots of damage and the nationalism. That was because preceding that was a nationalizing state project that got people to try and forget their differences that actually realistically existed. Don't you believe that some forms of totalizing state nationalism actually obscure political difference and therefore create violence? No, Daniel. Preceding that was a state collapse followed by an extraordinarily weak state that just did a really crappy job of convincing people that they did in fact have things in common. Right. <laughs> Presumably, if you fail at nationalism, you fail at getting our benefits. We will concede that. But what we do think is that if you succeed at nationalism, you get our benefits. We think the logic's relatively simple. And in the case of the former Yugoslavia, when they then went on to talk about the ways in which ethno-nationalism ought to be supported, that again gets into things we aren't talking about within the motion, which again, we aren't supporting. So, no thanks. So, the next thing that they tell you is that nationalism causes strife. Uh, and that we're only talking about the sort of like, sort of hippy dippy kumbaya versions of nationalism and maybe we should actually take on something real. What we tell you is we are taking on something real. That there are plenty of ways in which you could have opted this case that would have taken on the, the questions about common and collective identity, but you didn't, and that's not our fault. What we also tell you is that the sort of questions that you have about, you know, creating false identities, that is to say the ways in which the United States whitewashes things, quote unquote, with the picket fence, are A, up for contestation, which is something that you only get under identities that can be repeatedly constructed and shaped by their participants. And secondly, what we tell you is that ultimately you have institutions that transcend all of these other parochial interests, which will be the point that I close on. 
So what Jen tells you is that there are institutions as a result of the state, and as a result of having a strong state, a state that people believe in, that everyone sees as, as their institutions, as opposed to a church that you don't belong to, as opposed to a class that you don't care about. The institutions of the state and the common project they're in is one in which you recognize that there are political trade-offs that you might have to make, but those trade-offs are made because you'll get yours the next time around, as well as the fact that you presume that the people who are making those decisions are making them in good faith. And they make them in good faith because you perceive yourselves as a part of the same entity and sharing beliefs and ideologies rather than finding yourselves in conflict with each other consistently. We think ultimately the nation state creates a grounds upon which you have a capacity to identify with other people and it has the capacity to identify beyond the ways in which we otherwise would be an utterly divided society. We propose. Of the closing half about other identities. What these guys want 
wanted to tell you at closing government is that actually nationalism doesn't crowd out other identities. We told you that it certainly did. It marginalised those other identities and marginalising those things in favour of other unifying characteristics was not effective, it was not constructive or it was not even like realistic in this debate. The example that they brought you was on the history of Tanzania. Swain and I are going to be pretty open about this. We don't really understand the history of Tanzania as much as we assume Oxford did. We got rid of our fact file halfway through this tournament. But the point <laughs> being is that we don't think that even the nationalist project of Tanzania was ever going to be able to accommodate all of the different people within that nationalist project. Indeed, the number of POIs that we asked the, the government bench on whether or not they thought that nationalism could accommodate all of those people suggested that they didn't even think that. All of their responses to our POIs was, no, it cannot accommodate everyone. That's why it is okay to opt out of a nationalist project. So it was important that our extension spoke to the unrealistic or like, aim of nationalism to actually unify people. I'll take a minute now. Nationalism is an ongoing belief in the value of the state. But the content of that nationalism and the content of that state is up for contestation. Why is nationalism, as opposed to one particular type of nationalism, bad? I mean, I don't think that it is up for contestation for the reasons that I just brought you, that we don't think it is easy to dissent from that nationalism. But moreover, if it is unifying, we think that you marginalise other forms of identity. For instance, the American dream of, our, well, this is really the Australian dream, of having a two-acre block, of having a house with a backyard, having a house with a picket fence. Firstly, that is inherently materialistic. It is inherently capitalist. It suggests that people who can't get there are less American. It is also heteronormative in the way that it suggests that a nuclear family is the best thing for Americans to aim for. We think that that marginalises other identities and we don't think that got sufficient response from Oxford because we think that, they do, that nationalism exploits these other identities in defining a nation. Like the type of good nationalism that they wanted was one that would not define the nation at all because if there is no dream or nation to attach to, we don't think that you are ever going to be able to remain silent on the ideas of what that nation wants, which is apparently what the government bench wanted in today's debate. We think that they were unable to prove to you that nationalism wouldn't marginalise those identities, because in order to get a persuasive image so that someone could attach themselves to of what a nation looked like, they inherently needed to appeal to the majority, which was also our analysis of how this was, a, like, a, this was an image that was constructed by elites. It was constructed by the state, and they have a majoritarian interest to often marginalise those other images within that state, which is harmful when they have no ability to opt in to that national image. And as I like said in my introduction, even Steph acknowledged that when she said that in order in Yugoslavia to have nationalism, they needed to have a state to define that nationalism. We think that that conceded our material about how nationalism is defined by elites and is defined by the state. We think that in the end of this, uh, that at the end of this issue, that what we proved to you is that other identities are fundamentally important. It is problematic in, pol in politics to just pretend like those identities don't exist. So what the, the uh, closing government's extension told you was no, you could just define nationalism positively you could define everyone's interests as being the same. Problematically, our extension told you that everyone's interests aren't the same. In a national project, it is not okay to pretend like everyone's interests are the same. That means that people are inherently sidelined because people who are more marginalised, people who are, are less enfranchised, have a problem accessing that nation. When all of the government bench told you that in order to engage in the nation, you have to opt into that nationalist project. In order to care about the nation, in order to affiliate with that nation, you have to also buy into that nationalist project, we think that people who choose not to are marginalised. That is harmful in this debate when nationalism inherently cannot realistically cope for everyone, accommodate everyone in that debate. We told you specifically that we think that they marginalise women, they marginalise gays, we think that they marginalise people who can't afford to aspire to that national image. Because we think it is unrealistic for nationalism to accommodate everyone, and when it doesn't, it marginalises those it doesn't accommodate, we are very, very proud to oppose. <laughs>
And as by the way, our panel's adjudicators, we hope that they don't have a 2.5 hour long adjudication here tonight.